Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining. I am Rose October, your host for Arts, Culture, and Things in Between. As I've been doing for the past few weeks, I want to do again today, which is to tell you a little about arts, culture, and things in between. This is a program that features individuals who are gatekeepers of our arts and culture. They're not only performing artists, but also teachers, advocates, and scholars who focus on the preservation of the arts and culture. When arts is mentioned, it is being referred to the different art forms, such as visual, applied, or performing arts. Examples of visual arts would be painting, sculpture, photography, and film. Examples of applied arts would be architecture, as in designing and or building or, or constructing. Under applied arts, fashion design can be found, which would include working with different types of patterns and fabrics. Jewelry design is also considered applied arts, in which the artist is working with materials such as wood, plastic, metal, silver, and gold, and working with various types of stones. Furniture design also comes under applied arts, working with different types of woods, the ways the woods are cut and designed. Performing arts now, is another one of the features when I talk about arts. And under performance arts or performing arts, we can find music, photography, film, theater, opera, drama, singing, and stand-up comedy. The other part of this program talks about culture. And when culture is mentioned, it generally means the way of life for a particular group of people. So for this program, it is inclusive to means the various groups of individuals that embrace the way of life, looking at attitudes and behaviors. What is important to note is that as culture is mentioned, I'm really looking at how practices are passed from one generation to another. The, the last part of arts, culture, and things in between, emphasis on things in between, that has to do with life's issues that affect the execution of the arts and cultural practices. This involves both positive and negative experiences from which our forms grow and develop. So there you have it, a little uh, background about the program, arts, culture, and things in between. Let me welcome you, those of you who are joining again, and those of you who are joining for the first time, thank you. Today, my guest, is a phenomenal performer in my book. And I take pride in saying that because she is unique in that way. But before I invite her to come on, I want to have you view a snippet of what her work looks like in a slide. So we'll take a quick break and 
introduce you to my guest through a slide. So my guest today is Ailushi Mystery, who is a Brooklyn-based teaching artist, performer, and choreographer, whose work is grounded in the secret arts tradition of India. Ailushi was born and raised in Gujarat, India, where she studied Bharatanatyam classical dance. There she completed her Bachelor of Arts in Bharatanatyam at Gundarva University, Gujarat, and further advanced her studies at Kerala, Kalamandalam, Kerala. She's also studied privately with renowned Bharatanatyam gurus and is trained in Gujarati folk dance traditions such as Garba, Ras, and Divada. In 2001, Ailushi migrated to the United States. Since doing so, she has studied arts administration at New York University and at the Foundation for Dance Education at 92nd Y. In order to better understand how different dance traditions draw on unique movements and the use of space. She also studies Kathak, Kujiputi, modern dance, and West Africa dance. Ayulushi is currently affiliated with the Arts in Education and Folk Arts Program at the Brooklyn Arts Council, where she leads hands-on workshops for students in New York public schools. These students are introduced to traditional Indian dance, folk tales, and sacred narratives. To her credit, in 2015, she was awarded a fellowship in folk traditional arts from the New York Foundation for the Arts. I present to you, Ailushi Mystery. Ailushi, welcome. Namaste. Thank you. How are you? I am good. Thank you for this wonderful afternoon spending with you and the folks through this medium. Uh, I'm honored and thank you for your kind words. I am just uh, humbled to be in this uh, venture with the culture and, and sharing this culture in this land. You know, I could not have thought not about not having you as a part of this because I know how much you eat, breathe, and think, <laughs> and sleep, and dream about culture. Yes. And I say that because we've had the opportunity to work on quite a few ventures together. Mm -hmm. And I believe that our passions really shone through when we served on the same panel, when at the um, American Folklore Society, 
conference. That was quite an experience. Hopefully we can get into that, but let's talk a little bit about how you got started with dance in India. Um, well, I will give all my credits to my parents um, and especially my mom. Uh, her passion for culture and especially dance. Uh, she did not have an opportunity when she was growing up. So she, when I was given birth uh, and she fulfilled her wish by enrolling me to the dance class. So it was just uh, going to the dance class, taking like one class after another and slowly and slowly I was growing. Uh, my passion or the seriousness uh, about the art form, the journey sincerely began after I graduated my BA, that is Visharad we say, after completing seven to 10 years of my journey. After that, I, I kind of know what roadmap I was on. So I give my credit to my parents, uh, both mom and dad. So this how is old, my journey. How old were you when you started dancing? Uh, I was eight or nine, I will say. Okay. And just to give our viewers an understanding of how it works in India, you're eight or nine years old. Right. So this was an extracurriculum. So this was outside school. Um, so on Saturdays, you go to one hour class. On Sunday, you go again for another hour class. And so first year, second year, third year. So seven years of, uh, of uh, training takes place. And after seven years, you complete your Bachelor of uh, Arts in Bharatanatyam. And then you go for furthers like masters and, and then further PhD. So, by the time I graduate by doing my bachelor's in, in university uh, with literature at the same time, I was continuing my dance journey. So it was like one day my mom just pointed out, did you know you had double graduate in bachelor at the same time? So I was at one time walking out with two bachelors uh, simultaneously. So yes, uh, I started my dance journey at the eight or nine year old. But then uh, slowly and slowly I progress with my dance journey. And since my, I am from Gujarat, this Bharatanatyam is from South India. And uh, to further study, to know what the roots looks like, because through the studies and books, um, it really inspired me to like, I really want to go and know where this art form is. So I, um, I was um, enrolled in Kerala Kalamandalam to do further studies. And um, I got enrolled and, and spent time just from morning to evening, it's just dance. So after getting my bachelor, I further went down south to know the roots of, of Bharatanatyam. What's down south? Down south is Kerala, um, that is a South India. Uh, where Ta Bharatanatyam is from Tamil Nadu and um, I was um, selected in Kerala Kalamandalam and uh, I, I st started studying under a teacher. So that is a perfect Kerala Kalamandalam. Kerala is a state and Kalamandalam is a Kala, uh, means art mandalam center. So it's a performing art center. So all dance um, or music, um, flourishes, teaching happens in that school. Uh, after I graduated bachelor's from Gandharva University, um, I took my, my trip to Kerala and stayed oh. there for approximately three years. Wow. So I just want to go back a little bit because I had asked you some history behind the first collage of pictures, the first Mm -hmm. uh, slide that we showed about you right. and I know those pictures are very dear to your heart because it shows you uh, as a youngster yes a, a blossoming dancer correct uh, from the inception of and 
those pictures are precious because in them, I think one of them, there is a guru, one of your gurus, your mom is there. There is the institution where you studied. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that journey, how you were able to yeah, welcome um, onto that great stage? Yeah, I had to really give you my treasure from my treasure box, those uh, uh, pre uh, precious memories of my, my journey as a dancer. Uh, yes, uh, the couple of them were very, I was like probably in early tweens, teens. Um, and uh, when I was uh, studying in the schools, we have performances and uh, uh, like competitions. And uh, so um, I had a couple of pictures from that age. And then when you saw a photograph with my mom, that is my uh, Arangetal. Arangetal is a, after you complete your your vishara, um, you will have a platform to sh showcase and offer your dance journey to your teacher, to the audience, and uh, what you have like sh showcase as a dancer what you have gained in this journey as a as a as a vishara. And so that is every um, every student's uh, dream to help that performance and uh, um, you I had been practicing for that um, uh, performance for vigorously um, two years uh, because morning you go to the university you finish your college and then afternoon you again practice for your whole uh, three hour performance so it's a three hour long performance where you perform various dance recitals and um, some varies from three minutes to other other varies to 45 minutes minute a piece wow. so uh, those are those are also showing the strength as a as a dancer how uh, much you have gained knowledge about expressions uh, technicalities um, and, and it's a combination of all those like uh, rhythm and, and the language of the dance and, and as a dancer, how, how much you have gained that we build in those blocks as, a, uh, as you have gained the knowledge. So that's, the, that's like a first offering to your teacher in front of an audience and family member it happens. So it's uh, every time you go on a stage, bells plays a very important role. You saw a couple of pictures whenever I'm been going on a major stage performance, um, teachers gives blessing to those bells. Bells are very, very important in a dancer. So we, uh, those bells are blessed and then we put it on our feet. And, and when then, you say bells, I just need to interrupt. When you say bells, please yes. tell our audience, what do you mean when you say bells? So uh, actually I do have my first bell, which I'm oh. sitting. <laughs> uh, my mom has given me that uh, uh, this is, so this is my first pair of my, my dancing bells. So when I was little, this is what I was wearing. Wow. And so then as I grew a little older, my bells uh, changed. It has four lines. This is like a little, it has a pad in the back. So as you can see how many times I have worn that. Uh -huh. But it, it, this is this is when I was very little. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so something, uh, so those are the dancing bells. So when you put it on your feet, you you will um, tie it with this like a belt mm -hmm. and uh, adjust it and with the rhythm that and it will give the rhythm sound. So uh, those are the dancing bells. So I don't want to get too technical here <laughs> on you. I know. I've had my share of Kathak mm -hmm. dancing with my guru, the late Philip McClintock. Mm -hmm. And I learned that the technical name for, for bells are gungrus. Gungrus. Yes. Yes. Gungru. Yes. Yes. And although I know that they are worn the way that you showed just now with the, with the band and the bells on top, they also are stringed. Yes, different. So that is like different dance styles has a different uh, construction of those gunguru. So in Kathak, it's in a string and then you wrap it wrap around it. and then you tie it. In Bharatanatyam, we have 
uh, like this belt, um, belt shape um, gugurus. And uh, if it is a smaller child, you have one line because their feet are very delicate um, and they're still getting adjusted with their footwork and everything. So it's, it's one line. Um, dancing bell, then two lines, and then you progress to up to. So I have, I have my dancing bells are for four lines, which wow. are. Um, I hope I can pull it up. There you go. Sorry about that. I hear music. <laughs> so this is my current bell, um, ah. bells, and you can see it has a four mm -hmm. lines and in the back it is added mm -hmm. so and it's a one piece and then you tie it okay and then uh, this is my just an improvisation so i can like loop it on the top so it stays uh with the ankles tied um appropriately so it does not fall off or loosen up so it's just a backup backup security string which like a, to hold it with my legs so the string goes at the top and the belt uh, area, the buckle goes yeah. to the bottom? Okay. Yeah, so I tie this on the top, so it's like a boot, like a shoe. Okay. It give, gives a brick, uh, grip, and then in the bottom, I will tie this. So this is, um, everyone has a different, but this is also like almost 20, these bells are almost 25 year old, 25. I found my belts the other day too, and they are brand new. I couldn't believe it. I dare not put them on though. I don't think my feet can take it. But listen, let's yes. take a quick break uh -huh. and come back and okay. we'll talk some more. I know later on, I want to ask you the difference between some of the dance styles that you've sure. done. So we'll sure. get more into the bells and, and what they mean for the different uh, dance yeah. styles. Yeah. So let's take a quick break. I sure. look at some more of your work. <laughs> Thank you. लाल 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 रंग पे लके सुड़ा न सर तर पर पथरायो ऋतु नु राज पेलो फागण या गणिया वि अल पेलो लहरायो वाओ इट जस्ट गिव्स मी गुसबम्स सॉरी आई मीन दोस ऑल दोस स्टिल्स आई मीन इट्स सो एक्सप्रेसिव and 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 quite moving to just watch those pictures and i've seen you perform so i know i know what a what an uh, what an inspirational dancer you are and before we go further i would like to give credit to the musicians mm -hmm. because i know you asked permission to use uh, ask permission to use the music for both of the two slides that we have mm -hmm. had the first slide that showed you with your upcoming years, the music, uh, we should give credit to the music of K.A. Ganasham and Rishab. Mm -hmm. And for the this one here that we just saw, this slide, mm -hmm. we want to give credit to Feed Etinian Frasad of Harbour Lore, mm -hmm. especially Chris Young and Eric Almedia. We mm -hmm. want to give credit where credit is due. Thank you. So, you're welcome. So, as mentioned in your bio, you have been trained in many dance styles. Mm -hmm. You have a bachelor's in Barak Natyam. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to ask you how come mom was so uh, open to such, to such an event, aside from the fact that it was one of her dreams being fulfilled through her daughter. I wonder culturally how that was for her. Yeah, so, but... Hold on one second, I'll sure. tell you more. And you've studied Kathak and Kuchipudi among other than styles. Now, I want you to talk to the piece about mom and being so open to having her daughter study dance in addition to 
reflecting on what the community thought of that at the time. And then I'll ask you for us to look at how you would compare Bharat Natyam and maybe Kathak or Kujipudi, one of them. But let's talk to how mom dealt with sure. raising um, a child as a dancer. Definitely. Um, during when she was born and brought up, she she was um, we were under British rule. So and at that time, even uh, uh, sending girls to the dancing classes or, or teaching dance was a taboo. So coming from a, such a conservative background, because uh, when so many invaders, I don't want to go into much detail about right. but right, but like, mm -hmm. so all the arts forms were, were um, not utilized appropriately. So dance really became a, a where it was not respected. Um, when, um, when our renowned gurus, when they started traveling, to other parts of the world and got inspiration that there are so many classical dance styles in the Western part and it's respected so um, uh, well in the community. And we have a, such a old tradition and, and a culture of more than 3000 year old, like Bharat Najam and, and all of the dance styles. And it because of all these uh, political uh, uh, situation, it, it just, uh, our culture just was to not utilized properly. And so our great gurus, which are, uh, have done a great work during and rebuild the uh, uh, respect in the society, build reputable schools and, and really for, uh, work hard and advocate for the arts, advocate for the dance, revive back all this dance simultaneously in those early forties, and, and 50s and, uh, and my mom was young at the time. And um, so, yes, she wanted to go and learn those dance form, but my, my uh, she did not have an opportunity for that. But though she, she found her different art interests too. She's a fine arts, she does a reverse glass painting. So her, her, she expressed her, her art in a different format, different vision, um, and she ex expressed that. And when she met my mom, uh, when my mom met my dad, who is an architect, um, it was just a great union. Both of them were passionate for the art. And when I was born, um, slowly and slowly the world of dance was becoming more reputable now, more respected. Schools were more established uh, and the da dance from South India started to travel further north. And uh, when we had a first dance teacher in my city, my mom learned about that. There is a Bharat Natyam dance class is going to start in my city. And I was very little and she rolled in, took me there and enrolled in that school. So it was her passion plus cultural um, uh, changes and, and progress in the country and, and then adapting again. And that, that I was able to benefit from, from what my mom constantly keep up with, with the current matters that, okay, and now it's time to send Ailushi to dance class. So it is okay. So, so, you, so you've mentioned quite a lot in there in terms <laughs> of, no, very important points you've yes. made. The fact that your parents were exposed to the arts. Yes. Right? There yes. was also a different movement politically. Correct. There was also that ability of the transition of culture, mm -hmm. the transition of ways of life. Hence, mm -hmm. we're talking about mm -hmm. cultural practices, mm -hmm. the importance of keeping culture alive. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seemed as though with what you just shared, you were destined to be in the arts. I, I <laughs> yes, uh, I, I'm fortunate and I really am fortunate with my parents um, to, to have that passion. So I guess I can say I am destined to, but if they, if parents have selected different, different field for me, 
probably I would be in that journey and uh, my journey would be different. But I can't, I don't know what I would have done without, without death. I am glad that they made that choice. <laughs> I'm telling you because what a blessing you are to the, uh, to the field of dance generally. Yeah. And I, I really admire the poise that you, you, you have as not only as a performer, but the presence that you have as an individual. Right. And I also give more credits also those who are the dance advocates down south who started working hard to bring reputation to the dance field, any art field, music, dance, because they are like interconnected because there are so many temples in south, which is like a literature crowd in the temple. And literally uh, when when the history was like really forbidden so when those renowned teachers they really work hard to get scripts from studying those uh, uh, sculptures which are in the temple created the steps created the music what is this storytelling so those are the temple which are really today even exist and it's a it's a worth visiting and and it's like a literature right sitting there and you can you can learn from the sculpture so this is the hard work which our uh, which our uh, teachers has gone through in south to revive back and from those sculptures today we are dancing transforming that st uh, like um, static sculpture but transforming into a movement so that's a vigorous vigorous work they have done and also fought against the taboo and bringing. So that was one aspect of it. And my parents, another aspect of it. So with, with those two aspects, like many, many dancers today uh, around the globe are benefiting from those two benefits. Yes, uh, hard work from our renowned teachers who has worked initially to, to bring break through the taboo and, and the parents who has, has take an interest to enroll their son, their daughter, and, and exposed to the rich culture and heritage uh, to pass it down to the next generation. And today we are, I'm sitting here in America, uh, miles away from home and sharing this culture and heritage to this land. So yes, there is so much, I cannot take credit just for me, but those who have done for me, I give credit to them. You know, I'll steal a little limelight from you right now because you mentioned your teachers and there have been two significant women right. in my life who are my teachers. Mm -hmm. And I know for sure one of them is watching with her son, Kevin. And that is my dear beloved teacher, Stella Walcott. She is my love. She is my mother. She's my everything. And I know that she's beaming right now, mm -hmm. but she has been instrumental in starting my dance career at the age of nine. Mm -hmm. And those of you who are wondering my age, I'm just old now. I'm not good. I'm not going to tell you how, how old I am, <laughs> but I want to pay homage, uh, take the opportunity like you are right now to pay homage to your dance teachers, your gurus and those who've supported you and do the same thing with you. And, and say thank you to those individuals who have nurtured me, especially my teacher, Stella Walcott, who is watching today. Teacher Stella Walcott, thank you, my love. I love you. I love you, my mommy. But I want to ask you the other part of this question that I had put forward when we started this segment. What, which two dances would you like to compare? Uh, one of them, I would, I would say, let one of them, I'm taking back that question, let one of them be Bharatnatyam, which mm -hmm. is your expertise, mm -hmm. right? The one that you're most comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Which other one would you like to talk about in terms of how they work, with a similar or differently? So, so when I I was studying and uh, as a dancer, your body um, a body has learned learn the muscle memory and uh, express it the way you want to move. So um, I had taken Kachipudi 
and also Kathak and man, on a first day, my bro body just broke. It's like, I cannot move. I said, what happened here? Because now with the Kuchipudi and Kathak, I'm using a different muscle bo muscles and, uh, and formations. And I'm like, wow, it was just one of those aha moments. Like, yes, I have been doing my dance studies since I was young. So I have gained the strength in my muscles and my muscles is, is ready to jump into another dance style. But no, I was wrong. Um, I, have my, I have to shift my, my mental uh, for to accept these new new nuances, which is being presented by the students. So um, Kuchipudi compared to Bharatanatyam is like a like a springing dance, and in Bharatanatyam we have three speeds. Uh, I will uh, we can uh, we can say three speeds for slow, medium, and fast. If you and, were to if you were to mouth those those speeds off, could you give me a bowl or two? Like. Um, so if I, that's a very basic tatado cholakata. So so uh, this is how progression um, in in a scales it increase so the scales remains the same but so hold on one second <laughs> so let me say this you were saying te 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 right in kathak i know we did te te ta ta te te ta and when we started we started out very slowly and those are the foot movements going with the bowls, kind mm -hmm. of. And mm -hmm. then that could go up. I don't know right. how many speeds. Right. You're saying that it's a similar transition. Right. Similar. Okay. From, from slow, medium, and fast. So it's like four, eight, 16 kind of a transition. Okay. Um, and um, so in Kuchipudi, uh, I learned that four speeds. So it's more, it has a one x one one level high, uh, and it is a springing more a springing dance uh, compared to. When you say dancing. springing, do you mean you have to go down and up, down and up, yeah. down and up? Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, in Bharatanatyam, you have to maintain aramandi, that is plie plie. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to maintain, but in in Kuchipudi, you go up and down, up and down, and it it really gives a fun, fun alum, fun feeling in, in doing that moment, but, but it comes with a practice. So, so something which is, which is like totally opposite of uh, Bharatanatyam and, and, and increasing one tempo high. So, uh, and um, also dressing are different uh, than, uh, than a little bit different. Um, and gestures are also a little different. So there are different elements in, in comparing um, between Bharatanatyam and, and, and Kuchipuri. Whereas in Kathak, it's a whole different, it's a Northern dance style. This is all Southern dance styles. Um, so you can follow rhythms uh, with the Kuchipuri, with the Northern, you have to add up whole uh, North Indian Hindustani music. This uh, South is a Karnataki music. So uh, with a, so with Kathak you have to spin, spin a lot, a yep. spin, and it's more uh, that is not not that many uh, uh, much uh, plie or aramandi, mm -hmm. and um, um, so it's more uh, spinning moments. Uh, so whole it's a, a even the rhythmic is different. Right, I was about to say that rhythms are different. Uh, um, everything is language is different, dressing is different. So it's totally opposite to the north and the south, and it's it's just like yes, you are trained dancer, but when you start working with different dance form, your body is not tuned with, to adapt the new. So you have to, and now you have to come back to your original dance style, and like it's so I I and when I expose myself, my challenges um, taking um, with to just how the special in those dance forms works because it's not similar, it's different. 
and 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 going into those adventure uh, allowing yourself uh, gives you an amazing feeling which i experienced so which is like something you discover new within you as a dancer and also include uh, extending your dance vocab too right uh, yeah. and, uh, yes so it's every dance form um every dancers are doing such a great job um working hard vigorously day and night to get those um moments right so um the passion goes behind the hard work goes behind to execute those moments uh, and tell those stories because these are all the dance styles in india which are the common denominator is is telling a story so we are telling stories through gestures to expressions to footwork to the through body movement so you have to acquire those those skills so one is so one of the things that i admire of bharatanatyam dance experts is really how those poses are held you know for Katak, you might just pass through a pose and then you continue, right? And you move. It's very fluid mm -hmm. and all of that stuff. But there is a special, a special presence mm -hmm. that that Bharatanatyam dancer brings because it's like you have to hit those poses, those mm -hmm. sculptures, like on point, and it gives such vivid photographs when you see a Bharatanatyam dancer being photographed. Um, I'm wondering, in addition to paying attention to those sculptures that you talk about, um, maybe statues, um, is, was there a special class that you had to do to, to learn that? So when we go through this vigorous seven, 10 years of a journey of a as a as a student, um, each each uh, year you you have different training. So first year, two first two years, you acquire training to get your body adjusted with all the techniques, uh, footworks, your hand gestures, um, expressions, and it's like one block after another block okay. you are given. So then you are in second and then third, fourth year, you will be exposed to telling a story, small, small stories. And that is like you have gained uh, gestures, you have gained knowledge of expression. Now you have now you have learned the technique, footwork. So now those those are the blocks we have to now put it together in a sentence formation. And now you are going to tell a story, which are, um, so So that is a practice you build upon on every year. And it's sadhana, we say sadhana is like a meditation. Meditation is deep involvement in those stories mm -hmm. because uh, uh, yes, um, you feel within when you are learning, you feel within, but to bring it outside on, on, on your face, it's only you get it through deeper connection with in and getting involved in that character because when you are performing solo or in a group we are all but so when you're performing solo you sometimes enact three four different characters and each character has their own position and you have so you have to constantly switch through one character to another character and based on the story, you have to swiftly change those uh, expressions and emotions. So uh, it will come through practice and practice. And yes, it's a journey. And every time certain dance forms, which I pick it up, I just, when you transform yourself in those character, and when you finish your dance, it takes a time for me to come back as a Ilushi because you are becoming, you have an opportunity, not as an Ilushi, but you have an opportunity to, to be a Krishna, to be a, um, a Shiva, to be a Ganesha, to be a Hanumana, to be a Rama. So, and you, those are like mighty gods and you have to em embrace their power within you. And, and you have to feel those energy within you, then only you can justify and, and reach to the audience whom you are telling this story. So I'm, I'm having a goosebumps just express, uh, telling you, <laughs> but, 
but it takes time when I come back into my normal Ailushi space uh, because it takes you in. So it, it comes through a lot of practice, um, a lot of med meditational practice um, pra uh, to get into those expressions and moments. So what I'm also hearing is that spiritual connection also. Mm -hmm. Yes. You have to be able to trans transition there to really build that. Become, yes. Right. Yes. Uh, if, uh, if, um, um, if I want to be like Shiva and who is furious, I have to feel him. I have to, then only I can bring those expressions. But if, uh, uh, or a tender moment when mother is 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 uh, 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 taking care of her child and and putting the baby to the sleep. You have to transform yourself into that motherhood. So it's immediate transformation. And when there is a Krishna who is like playful, trying to play uh, on the on the bank of river with his with his childhood friends and, and, and doing all this mischievous. So you need to transform into those mischievous moments. So it, <laughs> it, so you can, in, the, in, in this very, as a dancer, you, ha, you go through a childhood to a mother, to a deity, um, and based on the, so you need to swiftly transfer into, into young and adult and er, every moment of our, our journey. So, um, it comes with a lot of practice. So I'm also hearing some acting slash drama in there. Yes, yes. Uh, kind of when you are doing um, all the story, it turns into a one act. Uh, if I'm dancing alone, I like a solo dancer. It's a one man show uh, or one woman's <laughs> show uh, putting together and, and, and acting and telling the story. So story is not just one person's story. There would be so many characters within it, like Parvati and Shiva and Kartika and Ganesha. So there's a family of four having, an, having this, um, their afternoon and, and, and whatever story is, you are performing. So you're transforming into four different characters. Uh, wow. And so, um, and if there is therefore individual as a dancer, like a group performance, then each one is is depicting those character. Then one person is just doing one one part of the character, and the others are distributed. So then it becomes a different. It's like a ballet. It becomes mm -hmm. like a like a like a theater production. Okay. Good. So this is a good time to take a break. Uh huh. And we'll come right back and talk some more with my sure. guest today, Ailushi Mystery, who is a renowned Indian dancer uh, whose expertise is in Bharat Natyam. And I just want to welcome those of you who've joined us late. You are here with us at uh, watching, that is, arts, culture, and things in between. And I am Rose October. We'll take a break and come back with my guest today, Ailushi Mystery. <laughs> Ailushi Mystery, just a snippet. It's such a pleasure to watch you dance every time, Ailushi. I mean, 
We're Thank just you. really skimming the edges here <laughs> with your, your work. So let's transition a bit there. Sure. Uh, where was that snippet recorded? So um, this was in Brooklyn, in New York. Um, one, first one was in a Sunset Park. It was a cultural uh, celebration um, afternoon organized by young dan a young uh, dancer repertory. And um, I was um, asked to perform for a few minutes and it was just an introduction. It was a workshop uh, where uh, students will just learn few movements from uh, Bharatanatyam. So I was performing and then teaching them the, some of the hand gestures, some of the uh, basic steps. So it was in, first one was in, in uh, Sunset Park and the second was in a carol, um, in a, car a school in a carol gardens. Uh, it was a parent uh, engagement afternoon. Uh, where I was invited to just perform. So I had performed one dance um, and um, that was a sneak peek of ah. one of those dance in, in Brooklyn. Okay, so you've migrated to the United States since 2001 and yes. you've done a lot to yes. preserve uh, your Indian culture and traditions as seen in those mm -hmm. two clips that we combined. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you two loaded questions. The first one is, what are two motivating factors for doing this? And then the other one would be, what are some challenges that you've experienced? So let's look at the first one first. Uh, the first question, what are two motivating factors for you uplifting, preserving your Indian culture here in the United States? So yes, I moved um, to the United States in, in 2001. So I, I come with this baggage of knowledge. Um, and uh, when I, um, so I was given opportunity to perform, to share, to teach. So as I'm getting um, my, my feet here, and this is very unknown world for me um, and how to venture out. Um, don't know much, um, no more, not that many connections back home. Yes, you have, I had my own school and I had my, my students and you have your whole different, different background. For now here you're starting from scratch uh, in an unknown space. So slowly and slowly uh, started a um, journey and uh, yes, my passion for my dance was deeper at that time. And I didn't want to just let it go because I <laughs> work hard in that. And uh, I was just trying to be patient, like what, what are the opportunities out there? And how can I, I be part of that culture and tradition to, to continue here because there are many Indian families also here. They want to send their kids also. And even non-Indian, uh, they want to learn about Indian culture. So I was at the same time being exposed to both, both world. And it was a great, um, uh, I, it was a great moment for me just not to restrict myself in Indian culture, but like also, work with non-Indian community. So I always have this passion to work with all. It's like uh, in our culture, we have like the world is one family. I have that ingrained in my, my, my journey. So uh, I started working with both um, Indian and non-Indian community and slowly and slowly, I was given an opportunity to work with the summer after summer camp, like which are like after school program or the after in the beginning years. So when the summer begins, there are summer camps. Uh -huh. uh, and then I'm slowly, I'm like my interest just picked from there, like what is out there. So that was a motivational one opportunity 
exposed to another and it was just one door was leading to another door and I have allowed myself to to just keep going and find find the way in in this community in this country in this in this space space and based on whatever opportunity was brought in to choreograph to teach to be an arts educator I have also tried to gain knowledge, um, did studies, so that I have a learn. I have learned methodology how to teach traditionally from India, and and, and also adapted um, met teaching methodology from uh, from United States, like from New York, and so that I can combine both teaching methodolo methodology when I go to the um, public schools because um, in public schools they are exposed um, through the curriculum they are bringing world culture in the classroom and we have to cooperate those curriculum and how do I build all those so I need that that foundation that clarity to speak both language so that uh, that uh, it will help me to to talk in the same language so <laughs> though English is a common language <laughs> and a dance has its own language which does not require a language but like that is a certain way where you have to add up more paperwork when there is a paperwork you have to do at that time there, there is a scratching moment like mm, I need some knowledge here so uh, submitting paperwork I need to, to build my foundation in studying different methodology so, although we're talking dance here, yes, specifically Indian dance, your story is resonating with many immigrants yes. who are watching because yes. what I also heard is the resilience behind your, your, your journey, the resilience involved in your journey. I can't right. even say behind your story, the resilience involved in your story, in your life, in your pathways, because you had to work with what you had in recreating, in adapting, in assimilating, in acculturating, in all of those things, plus some as an immigrant. And it's not easy. And we'll get to talking about that in a minute, because I have another question that would allow you to speak to that. Yes. And this is the loaded one. <laughs> if we thought that the first one was loaded, think of this one. What are some challenges you experienced? Yes, the challenges is we need a dancer to entertain us. <laughs> uh. <laughs> so there is a lot of preparation, but when it comes to, uh, it's always a free performance, a volunteer performance and, and so forth. Plus even, um, as a dancer, there is a lot of preparation when you come to the to the stage and every minute, every second is counted and we have to advocate for ourselves. And in the beginning, yes, you want to spread your word, spread your name or spread your work. And, and there is a lot of sacrifice you will be doing. Yes, a lot of work you will be doing, but in, in, in terms of reward, you will not get much. And uh, in back home yes you have your musicians you have costumes which is like you can because the market is right there and you it's accessible over there where it here uh you do not have your own musician everything is on a pre-recorded you do not have access to the material you do not have access to so everything is like what do i have in my closet and i can make it through happen and it's like from very little you have to present pristine pristine performance so um what can we do from from very little limited resource and that is a challenge here and everything is like going back so whenever i go back to india it's always like think of what can i bring back for my performance or my teaching tools or teaching material and everything is over there here i either i if i find it it will be very costly um and uh, so this is this is a journey between two worlds. Um, just because as an immigrant, 
I, I'm sure many immigrant dancers also have a similar story. It's like um, you, you, your luggage is your your dance material, your instruments, your uh, everything what you need. So nothing else you are bringing, but is for your art form. And um, so struggle. So um, yes, so find it. It's a lot of con um, because my art form compared to other um, art form is very limited um, uh, need, I will say, or request because it's Bharat Natyam, it's from India. It's a very geographically narrow dance selection, whereas here kids are exposed or our community is exposed to modern dance, salsa, tango, hip hop, all those which are like popular, whereas Bharat Natyam and other dance styles which are from other parts of the world has a very limited uh, request. So it comes down to very small opportunity. So when you get that opportunity, I am just uh, thrilled to have that opportunity and make it even five, seven minutes performance the best uh, I can do to connect with the audience, to introduce to the culture where I am coming from. So uh, there is a lot of, today I am, here but it took a long t long year to break through through the through the market i will say <laughs> it was not an easy journey it was uh, like as a dancer we are we are trained to keep smiling face <laughs> but inside it's a lot of lot of preparation and a lot of uh, you you get up, keep going, take the next step, keep going. Um, yeah. And not that, easy. No, it's not easy. It's not easy. And one of the things that I know as a, an artist myself is that we make it look so effortless. What yes. We do. Yes. So others feel that they can just mimic us until right. they try something and th they realize that they should not have tried it right. without supervision. Mm hmm. And, and here, one more I, I would like to add is weather. Weather plays in another crucial pl um, in role in, in, in a dancer because um, I will say approximately seven to eight months we are in a cold weather. So my dance form is barefoot and, and going in, in this weather, the classrooms or the performance space is cold and, and you have to strike your feet with barefoot plus traveling with the public transportation so you have to carry everything with you so there are a lot, lot of lot of preparation goals which are challenging and you do not have enough space to get ready instantly so it's like as a dancer you are lugging everything um, and uh, making it happen and yes you coming when you come on the stage as if it just did, it was magic. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> magic. Uh, but like, yes, uh, weather, uh, weather plays an important role. Uh, barefoot uh, in a silk dress. And uh, um, so forget about the pain, go home, warm it up. And, uh, but uh, you have to go through those. Um, I cannot dance wearing any other, other shoes or anything it's a, yeah. it's a barefoot so you have to warm up you have to have that energy build that energy in in when you begin your performance so it's a lot of meditation i said which will help you to go go through this struggle and a journey which gives you the strength so it's a it's a lot of meditation yeah it calls to so, uplift your energy so thank you thank you for that i I heard so many different pieces of inspiration, but I think it's at this point, just before we take another break, that I need to say, especially to the parents who are watching us and listening to us, and I hope that they have the young ones next to them, their offsprings and maybe their nieces and nephews and, and, and other young family members to really get a, a better understanding of what getting involved in the arts means and arts and culture because we're talking also about passing on this knowledge passing on traditions passing on what we've learned so that they can be a different 
and a respectful appreciation for mm -hmm. our arts and culture. So mm -hmm. on that note, we'll take a break. You're watching Ilushi Mystery on arts, culture, and things in between with your host, Rose October. We'll take a break right now. is about paying our respect to we address as Mother River, respecting the valuable resource this river provides to us for every living organism, human being, as well as uh, life in the water. River is starting it's like a life cycle starts from mountain and meets to the ocean in its path it touches everybody absorbs everything then meets happily to the ocean and that is also what human being life cycle is we begin our journey and we, we finish our journey river sea is with us and we are just asking for protection blessing for the whole journey we live together yeah. and we want to be with the peace and harmony and with our all the wishes and hope we go to the nature and ask for uh, those fish, uh, wishes to be fulfilled so river has heard everybody's wishes and sorrows so it's it's like a mother helping us through through the through the course of the life yeah. it's just not a river but it has taken the, the stage of a mother, which we do in India. And I want to bring that here and share my information, share my culture with Brooklyn. To Brooklyn for that experience. Last year we placed 240 lands. This year we are planning to place 400 lands. So if you are planning, we are planning and working on to bring this ceremony every year. So if you are interested, to hear about when are we planning to do this next year please leave your contact information that way we can update you we have a river in my uh, city and my grandma grandpa brought this tradition on a very smaller scale but like everybody just started participating in when we are putting all this lamp together we we sing together we make all the cotton weak and putting ghee and then men will be passing down all these lamps whoever wants to uh, put those lamps and and they are floated away into the river with the prayer with their wishes with with their blessings three thousand four thousands of those lamps countless i i'm just making up a number but like that river is like filled with those lamps and it's mm. crisp cold night full moon and in in that light you will see the water as a blue because of the reflection and all these lights are shimmering that fl flowing away in mm. uh, down to the river it's just i still have that the visual mm. still in my very fresh in my memory uh, maybe if i am a painter i can put it down but i cannot just i look forward for those nights because i really enjoy that it's full of people like lots of like hundreds of people are there but it's so peaceful it's mm. very contrast uh, very contrast so many people but everybody is chanting together and putting this lamp slowly and solemnly and carefully we i really enjoy that mm. moment it stayed with me and i i really wanted to because i'm here since 2001 and i have not done this for quite a long time and this is something which I miss. So, <laughs> one of my favorite projects that you do, because I've gone to the RT Hindu lamp ceremony a few times and that's what it is. So for our viewers, it is worthy to note that since 2013, uh, every summer, Ailushi has led and performed the RT Hindu lamp ceremony, which we just saw. That's what it is. And this ceremony is held at the Brooklyn Bridge Park and is attended especially by New Yorkers of various backgrounds. It is a ceremony that engages the community in collective art making while bridging sacred traditions of India and America, to which Ailushi referenced Mother Ganga and the New York Harbor. 
So you've gotten a snippet of what the RT Hindu lamp ceremony is. You've spoken a lot to that in that clip. Now I did some digging and found out that there is Rangoli. What is Rangoli? Rangoli is uh, Rangoli is a um, sand um, art um, done in front yard or the thresholds. Um, it's an it's a ritual. It's an auspicious ritual which is performed daily. And if it is a special occasion, special celebration, more elaborate uh, uh, designs are done. But what kind of designs? Um, so there are so many different um, different um, formation takes place. The traditional ones with so there are um, white marble if I could show you, white marble sand, uh, which you, you take a pinch and then you create a design. Uh, and this is on the ground? On the, on the ground. So first, so let me just, uh, so Rangoli is, a, is itself is a design done with a marble sand. Um, then there are color sands. So depend on each individual in the family has their own artistic skill. They create some design, some floral design. Then there are some geometry shapes, like you just put the dots and then you create a pattern joining the dots and then you fill colors based on the what colors are, is uh, inspiring you to fill. And um, so there are free forms. Um, so depend on each and every individual. My sister-in-law does does two simultaneously strokes, which I could not do it. So I was just blown away when, when she got married and first day she started doing this. I'm like, whoa, I do not know. Even today, I still, don't, still do, I can do one, one line, but she can, she can do two lines and many can do four lines. So all these, uh, the gaps, you hold the sand and then you release some gap and then you can create four line strokes and you create a pattern. Uh, my my sister-in-law can create two line stroke and create a pattern. I only have a grip of one line pattern. <laughs> so uh, it's depend on everybody has has how, how they can use their hand as a brush to create those patterns. Basically in the morning we wake up, you get, you, you clean yourself and then you offer, um, offer to and sun salutation and then you offer to holy ba uh, basil uh, water and then you also sprinkle water in front yard and then once it's it dried out you you cre the create this rangoli is just again a, another ritual meditation ritual to generate a positive energy in your living uh, living uh, surroundings. So my house, your house, everybody in the community is just doing that. So if we are collectively doing this ritual every day, um, charging, it. meditation is just not with the mind and body, but also surrounding, cleansing the surrounding area and, and charging um, the positive energy. When you dust, when you when you sweep, you are re removing the negative energy, and then you are bringing the positive energy. Okay. So to clarify for for those listening in, is this done at any particular time, or it's a daily ritual? It's a daily ritual in the morning and in in the evening. Some day do some also do it in the evening. Some they don't. Depend on on their busy life. Uh, depend on on. Uh, where they are living even if you're living in an apartment sometimes they do it inside or on a threshold of the front apart front front door so depend on where you are living every if you go to india you will see some smaller marking or just a dot just a dot also which also represents a rangoli so uh there as our life is becoming we say busy <laughs> and we want to still stay with our tradition and rituals every day. We are, we we continue adapting and 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 modifying, practicing our rituals. So Rangoli, and if it is a Diwali in the New Year, the whole street is filled with Rangoli. So everybody is participating, doing elaborate Rangolis, beautiful Rangolis are also done not only sands 
but with the dif with different flowers, different vegetables, different fruits. It depend on the harvest season. Whatever the harvest is, we incorporate that. Putting and then putting lights, the diva, uh, also in in those uh, rangoli, because a uh, light represents life and also purifying energy. So uh, these are the rituals which are daily performed even today. It's been performed for many many um, thousands of years, and we are still carrying those traditions. Let me ask you, would I be accurate in saying that for those who don't know what a rangoli is, that they can think of it as maybe a handmade carpet? Yes, uh, right now people are also familiar with mandalas. Right now there are so many coloring books like uh, coming dis distress or coloring books are yes. available in the market. So basically what you see those designs in a mandala in those coloring book, those are done on the floor using those uh, sand powder, which are very fine um, and, uh, um, and using the flowers, you can create the petals, you pluck all the petals and you, Create a create a different uh, um, rangoli. So, to juxtapose that, the rangoli and the RT lamp, Hindu lamp, the lamps are hanging. They're they're formed in a particular way, from what I remember. Could you talk to the structure of the RT lamp, uh, Hindu lamp? Hindu. Uh, so le uh, again, lighting lamp uh, is also very. A spiritual um, aspect of the ritual. Uh, it is representing life. Um, so anytime you go to the temple or even up in the front yard or even placing a lamp in the um, at the uh, ba uh, holy basil pot or even in the kitchen where we place water uh, pot for our daily consume, uh, we, we place a lamp. So lamp, it, is, play, is playing an important role in our journey, which represents life. Okay, I'm just stretching this, right? Now, the lamp is just a light or is it fire? It is a fire. So, as you, <laughs> I'm trying to find an object. I know, <laughs> but, but that's all. Okay, so hold on one second because we'll go further with this. So the lamp is fire uh -huh. and then you use the ghee Mm -hmm. in the bowl mm -hmm. with the designs with the wishes and everything and then it sails along the water mm -hmm. right so how do you connect the lamp with the fire and then this ritual of presenting your wishes your prayers in the bowl with the design so in india in india we we have like say we have many, many gods and god goddesses. We are also um, very um, um, respects our nature. We have animals, uh, sea creatures, birds. We have those also given a platform of a god. Uh, so we believe in nature. We believe in nature is our teacher. And so we respect everything. In India, um, so that means every every living organism we respect that energy which resides in on those in those individual which we we give them a pedestal of a god. So when we are cleansing in the morning and creating positive energy, so this we are talking something supreme, and then we place this light uh, also which is like offering to that energy so it's it's like everything we are building our surrounding respecting that moment which we believe in through those uh, rangoli patterns or through and and putting those lamps and now river is also a mother because that nurtures us and takes our stresses and when we take a bath in a shower what do we do we are distressing so that water is coming from river which is coming through the tap water so 
so it it is again recharging us from to the positive energy so so all this is we are we are paying respect through this medium of lighting lamp placing lamp and and just showing and making our journey and making the removing the darkness and bringing the bringing the light and removing the negativity and bringing the positivity so if, whether it's a river whether it's your front yard whether it's a kitchen whether it's your a tree um we those are something which we are constantly meditating and and that is our daily ritual and um we are it's we are we are respecting one another also the soul which resides in you or in, in a peacock or in a lion it's just that energy through the lamp thank you thank you i, I hope it makes sense <laughs> it does it does um and and it's a very for a western uh, philosophy or or practitioner yes there is a lot question like we are why not one god but we but without this nature we will not be able to sustain and we have to thank that that nature which is protecting us today and um what better way what better way to do it as our culture has developed this type of practices this type of ritual which is honoring the nature thank you good point for a break ailushi Thank you. Let's watch a little more of Ailushi's work. Again, thanks to you, those of you who are joining us late. My guest today is Ailushi Mystery, who is a renowned Bharatanatyam dancer, especially uh, giving back to our borough of Brooklyn in the United States. We thank you for your continued work, Ailushi. Let's take a break. The organization dedicated to helping Brooklyn-based artists, arts organizations, and community groups promote and sustain the arts. Bach is a, a very important uh, role, has played a role in my journey here in Brooklyn. Every step of the way, Bach has really given me guidance, support, wherever needed. I'm born and raised in India. I am a folk artist as well as a traditional artist. Such support is really essential in even if I don't get fully funded, but if that is uh, essential uh, to to organize that event. So it has really helped uh, in reducing some of the financial uh, load. In our arts and education program, where artists are receive receive training um, prior to their entry to the classroom, and it might be the first time they're going into a classroom to work with children or into a situation where they're working with adults as well. We are right now working with the third graders who are working, um, who are learning about continents. In the schools, they learn about different parts of other continents. So I'm bringing part of India. We also, uh, I bring all the different dresses which we um, uh, wear in India and they again compare and contrast what is different and the colors and the uh, material and everything, they get hands-on activity. So, as I've been saying, Ailushi, you're one of Brooklyn's mm -hmm. decorated Indian dancer, <laughs> uh, dancers in my book. I don't care what anybody else says. Um, and, and that clip done by Brooklyn Arts Council back, fondly called back Brooklyn Arts Council, Mm -hmm. It's a testament of that and Brooklyn Arts Council, um, you might have heard it throughout this interview or before me saying it again, is a non-for-profit organization that supports the arts and culture in the borough of Brooklyn specifically and, and Ailushi lives in the borough of Brooklyn. And they have supported um, your work, they've supported you. They pay attention to folk arts and the folk artists. Uh, they are very serious about, about the preservation of folk arts. And I'm so glad that Brooklyn Arts Council is doing that because where would folk arts be? Where would folk artists be? Where would immigrant artists be? Because many times when you talk about folk arts and folk artists, 
we're actually talking about the migration process, the immigrant story, and the struggles in keeping traditions alive. So we have to be thankful for the entity, Brooklyn Arts Council, for the work that they do. Mm -hmm. So through Brooklyn Arts Council, you have become a teaching artist. Let's talk about that journey for you from where you've come from and then you, you landed in the classroom as a mm. teaching artist. Let's mm -hmm. talk about that. Um, so I came across, I was doing a, a workshop in Brooklyn here in my neighborhood and uh, oh, where's that? In, in Bay Ridge and uh, one day when I arrived for my session, um, the organization where I was conducting workshop, they said that a lady had left you a, a business card. Um, you may follow up. And uh, okay, I did not, I know about Brooklyn Arts Council, um, but I had not tapped into it. Um, so when I saw a card from Brooklyn Arts Council and the lady has asked you to contact, and I will give a credit to Nicole, Nicole Markotsitz. Um, she left her business card. And um, next day I followed up, I sent her an email. She immediately contacted me. And then with Dr. Kate Turner and with Nicole, we had so many meetings because they wanted to know me. They wanted to learn about me. They were so much, so before we, before they put me into any, 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 contacts they wanted to know my background and my my journey so for two three years we were in in communication in within that two three years i had one project to perform at the brooklyn community college um, and uh, they had asked me to perform and create a story with in in conjunction with the days of the dead <laughs> Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> so first I have to learn about that culture where that festival or that ritual is performed. And now I have to create, based on my culture, a similar concept story to perform. Uh, I am like, was scratching and a challenge. I'm like, this is a challenging because now we have to build two cultures together through my performance. I made it through, it was a success, and she was really um, satisfied, means that um, Dr. K I'm talking to. Um, and then slowly and slowly, there were many professional development series happen. Uh, many years passed by, and one day I had an opportunity to do a professional development with the Brooklyn Arts Council uh, Arts Education Department. And uh, my partner was a director of arts education uh, that at that time was Carol uh, Sterling. Um, so she was my partner. And when we had to collaborate something in that professional development, something spark in her brain that we have to bring you in the school. We, we were doing some other work uh, for PD related, but I, I had to bring you in the school. <laughs> I'm like, sure. So then we started uh, communicating with, uh, um, uh, Dr. K was folk uh, department and Carol is in uh, Brooklyn Arts Council, uh, Arts in Education Department. So then we started having meetings with them and they saw my work, how, I have worked also in India um, and uh, how I was able to present my work through ex expectation as an as a teaching artist and like you already have this knowledge and we are we are not utilizing you appropriately and we are losing your talent or the kids are losing your talent so then they started putting up uh, some grants to bring me into the school and uh, and um, that was a pilot program which went success and um, many years passed by um, and uh, they are still sending me to schools, um, whether it's a young adult or seniors or whenever there is a possibility of, um, related to my work. Uh, so this is how I was uh, introduced to Brooklyn Arts Council. They saw various 
facade or various facet of my uh, aspect as a not as just as a dancer but as a as a cultural um, what I have brought as a, uh, in this community um, my culture and various aspects of the culture where I am constantly utilizing it. So it was just not like dancing, but there are many, many other roles um, I brought. And that was something uh, Brooklyn Arts Council really liked about me. Um, so they were, they were supporting me since then with my work. So the criticality for me of what you just said is allowing children to respect others, mm -hmm. allowing children to embrace cultures that are different from theirs, mm -hmm. allowing children the safe environment mm -hmm. to try something that is different. Mm -hmm. Hence, creating better yeah. youths, better communities, better world for us. Correct. So you're a teaching artist, you're in the school system. How does it work for you in terms of being a teaching artist? Are you going to more than one school? Are you just assigned to one school? Are you doing this around the clock? How does it work for you as a teaching artist? So when when um, Brooklyn Arts Council starts uh, communicating with the schools, when schools inform Brooklyn Arts Council that we are looking this type of, this time of the year, exposing children to different uh, culture, and if they say India, then um, I will be appointed for that. Um, they will send my portfolio, and if if they select, then we start have start having meeting what what the school wants from me in that um, residencies. So uh, we plan, um, and then I I'm bring I'm brought into the school, into the classroom. So there's a lot of uh, also uh, communication takes place, planning process takes place, um, and uh, those um, but whatever age range. They gave me background, what are their expectations and what can I bring into the classroom? So um, that is how I am in the classroom. And did you, I answer you? Yes, do, did you, do you go every day or it's oh, just a few days based on the curriculum, how it's built? Based on the curriculum and because their school schedule, school schedule is so jam tied and they had to carve out special hours two sessions in a day, it's, it's, it's a ridiculously uh, paper or like how the planning develops, but uh, it's a, it's a, a semesters like spring or summer or spring or fall or winter session. And then we swap the school. So if there are other teachers who are in other schools who are engaging, then we swap into the other classroom. So it's like a couple of days in a week or once in a day, once in a, once in a week. So okay. it's not um, like not a full year semester at all. Okay. Um, so it's like sometimes couple of sem a couple of schools, sometimes one school per season. Uh, so it varies what is out, what is the request or what is the need in the school depend on that um, I get opportunity. So it's very, very, um, very, very small window for my work because most of the time schools want like other genres which are popular here. When it, when it is coming to the cultural exposure, again, there are many other cultures uh, we are talking about. So which culture the school is going to pick, it's all like a, in the bowl, you, you pick the number. <laughs> and so, then, oh, okay, it's here. <laughs> so let me ask you, what what is what what is something that you enjoy when you are performing in the role as a teaching artist? Oh, uh, the 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 journey, the how kids um, 
are the critical thinking um, in uh, in um, creating those dance uh, movements and uh, collaborating with one another and uh, uh, problem solving with one another, the teamwork, the confidence building, um, all those aspects which we, through dance process, learning process, which, which we are, I do not sit there that, oh, I'm going to work today on this, but no, but like, giving them that opportunity through dance this is what is is developing in in one child's role and collectively it's a whole classroom and and they themselves are very surprised that when they when we look back like how we started on a day one which they had zero interest or i will say zero context and then how they have evolved after culmination and and um, they do not want to let me go. Um, can and even teachers also like. I hope we can hire you full time. How did you do this? And how? And sometimes teachers also gives compliment, which is like, yes, my work is done. When I I would never forget this child. And um, teacher gave me this compliment on after culmination is that, thank you for. Um, connecting, reconnecting with my, my student because uh, I have a different connection with my students. Um, they are raising their fingers all the time when they, are, when they are asked questions before that many fingers were not coming out. And now this has given a different confidence in them. So listening to this in the different um, classroom activity, their behavior, um, even they are doing maths, but they are doing takita takademi, takita takademi. They are learning maths, but when they are doing homework, they are reciting my sholakata. And teachers are amazed that how they are doing this multi learning process. And um, that is something which is, which like my, my role as a teacher, I have done. I have given that child that, that moment to go forward. So, let me ask you, how do you make the connection with confidence building, math, and doing well when they come to your sessions? How do you tie those together? Tied, uh, it happens magically, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just by respecting them, um, by those uh, talking to them in a most respectful way. The kids are still learning and... Uh, they, they do not have information. So we have to have a patient as a teacher, uh, why they act that way, because they are still learning. Uh, so we have to respect them, talk to them in their language and give, give that opportunity to, to ask the question so that we can give them that information. Share knowledge, bring those visuals. It's a lot of work goes in there, a lot of repetition. If you make a mistake, it's okay. You get up again and do it again. Um, re let's do it again, it's okay. Uh, but effort to do dance is like, your, your brain is developing some movement, but when you try to bring that in your body, it does not happen. And that is kind of breaking them. Like, I cannot do it. Let's try again. What? Okay, tell me, how does your movement look like? Draw it. So, so there's a lot of process goes behind. So they will either write it in a paragraph or so there's, we are giving them a language of a dance language, yes, but those kids are not aware of those dance language. They can only express within their limited uh, vocabulary. So we are developing their vocabulary. So we have to reach within them to pull out those movements, what they are describing so that we can incorporate in a dance process. So it's a lot of dialogues exchange taking place. But like, okay, you cannot do it. All right, sit down. That is not how I work. I will literally give that child an opportunity. Okay, take some time, rethink, and we can re revisit on that, but I will come back to you. Uh, and uh, that is giving them more confidence that teacher is taking interest in me. So what's embedded in there? Two things, my takeaway. 
art therapy mm -hmm. and dance therapy. Mm -hmm. You're saying, okay, draw it for me. That in itself is a form of expression. Right. It's a form of release. Mm -hmm. Like dance, if we were to put dance in a different context, dance can also be considered therapy. Right. So I am putting this together in a different way for our viewers to, to get it about how empowering being an artist can be or being involved in the arts can be. Because mm -hmm. many artists will say they are just lost away in their own world mm -hmm. when they're creating. Whether it's a dance, whether it's a painting, whether it's a sketch, whether it's a, a piece of... Uh, a piece of music, whether it, it, it's it's a poem, it, it, it's just a way of de-stressing. Right. And, and, and I, go ahead. I, I'm going to also connect, why I asked them to draw, I will connect back to my beginning conversation where the dance, uh, when my great um, teachers has done a great work to revive back the dance, they went to the temples and learned those sculptures. So reconnecting from those sculptures, I am dancing today um, because of those teachers' hard work. So, so something which was drawn on those temples walls, something which was carved on a temple wall, and that journey I'm not forgetting. So these kids which are born in America from different culture has not seen um, at, at that age, my culture or my country, but whatever visualizing I, visual, visuals I have presented to them, whatever I'm sharing my, my practice here, and they are developing their movement with, with, uh, to cooperate in the dance. So that's why I'm, I'm like, I want to see what you are seeing is a visual. So that is where I'm connecting my yeah. journey. You know, I like that. I like the parallel process because you're making that connection from where you came. Yeah those students will be able someday to yeah. make connections mm -hmm. from those experiences right. that they've had with you. Right. I yeah. mean, I, I listen to you and I am making connections. For example, when you mentioned your gurus earlier, I mentioned teacher Stella, who is like mm -hmm. another mother for me, mm -hmm. to me. Um, she's my teacher. She's my everything. And so is Daphne Rogers, who is another mother of mine. And these are women who were strongholds in my life, fixtures in my life, who have allowed me to develop mm -hmm. as a young child, as a young lady, as a young, as a young adult, as an adult, I, I am an adult and mm -hmm. I'm still referring to them. You are an adult and you're referring to your gurus. And oh no, I will never forget them. And, and this is the part of the journey that is very critical mm -hmm. to us passing on the knowledge that we've gained. But you wanted to say something. Yeah, I, in one of your questions, when you were mentioning that in a dance in Bharatanatyam, they, they sustain those poses. What they are trying to make an association is, is those poses with those temple, uh, temple carving, the sculptures. So mm -hmm. that is where it is reconnecting back to, to the sculptures which are in the temple. So when, when, the, when a piece is done and there is a, a sustained pose, um, and they, so that idle pose is they are trying to depict which is on the temple. So that is where again, connecting back to those temple sculptures and painting. It always comes full circle. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a break. Again, for those of you who've joined us late, you, we're, I'm sitting here with Ailushi Mystery, who is my guest for today. Obviously, she is a well-rounded expert at Bharat Natyam dance tradition. I'm still a student. <laughs> uh, still a student. And that's the great thing with being an expert. You're continuously learning. Yes. As, as, I learn uh, from those kids also every time when I go to the classroom. I learn something. <laughs> yes. And, and learning is a lifelong process. Yeah. yeah. Let's take a break, Ailusha. Sure. Sure. Okay. Like that. So you're losing Pasaka. So let's do it again. Pataka, 
I'm smiling widely. Mm. The first part of that clip in the classroom, I am looking at those children who are well poised. Nobody's giggling and, you know, covering their mouths. <laughs> Nobody's distracting. What did you do? And then we'll talk about the latter part of the clip. But what did you do? So this was the first class. And these are the Brooklyn public school students, which are non-Indian students. They are all multicultural students. And I was doing a demonstration of a hand gesture, single us asanyukta hand gestures, and they were learned. These are the vocabulary. I was um, just demonstrating them, and they were they were. Um, in Sanskrit language, which is one of our old language, and many of our scripts are in in um, Sanskrit. So they were saying Sanskrit with me, and the prana. I was just blown away in that very moment. That clip is very dear to me. It, even when and where, like they were pronouncing it very cl clearly, and they were very serious. They were very serious what they were doing. So they were make, doing so much hard effort to even follow me. So those were the hand gestures. These are the vocabulary which they were learning mm -hmm. um, with me. So, so tell us, you were, tell us some a couple of those hand gestures that you were teaching them. So, th so this is a pataka. So it's like... Pataka. Um, so usually you put it on a side, but side. because of okay. the... Like, right. Pataka. Pataka. Then, this is three pataka. Hold on one second. Okay, you see this? I you can't can. do it. Okay, so pataka. it's a ring finger okay, bending. I can't do that, Ailushi. Look at this. Talking it's about comes... muscle memory, right? Okay, I'm trying. Uh -huh. And then comes ardha pataka. I can do that well. Arka patata. Then kartari mukha. Outside. Carter. Right. It's outside. Right. Oh, this. Uh, there you go. Wow, yes. And then comes mayurakya. Mayurakya. Is this correct? No, uh, is this one? Is ring this finger. One? Okay. What is this uh, called? Uh, peacock. So this oh. is pataka. This is a flag. Uh -huh. This is one third of a flag. This is half flag. Okay. This is Caesar's leg. Okay. This is and peacock. The... Okay. Peacock. This is Ardha Chandrasya. This is half okay. a moon. Arala to bend. Arala. Shikatundakaha. That is a peacock. Okay. I'm uh, having to bend Okay. Mustachia, that is a fist. Okay. Chikarakasha, that is a peak of a mountain. Come in. Um, Here. Yeah, Chikarakasha. Uh -huh. Kapita, to, to hold. Okay. So these are single hand gestures, but like single hand. So then there are sub, sub alphabets. So just using pataka, then you have pataka. And so, um, Natyarambe in the beginning. So in the beginning, you have a position like this. Okay. Uh, so Natyarambe, then Vari Vahe, that is cloud. Vane, that is a, a jungle. Vastu Nise, then that is saying no. So this is just, it's like alphabets, A, B, C, D, then you learn all the uh, uh, words from A, and then you will learn all the words from B. Similarly, you will learn all the alphabets from Pataka, then you will also learn all the alphabets from Tripataka. So it's a language you are learning. So one and of then, the things, go ahead. And I'll then you. you tell a story. So it's like, this is a Sinha Mukha, but I am using that as a mouth of a cow or a, a depicting, depicting a cow. So okay. I'm like, with the Pataka hand, I'm like, make, like showing my affection, pampering that cow. Okay. And then with another Sihamukha, I'm feeding that cow. Oh, <laughs> these two fingers. 
I, I need the dance vocab. I can't have that. <laughs> um, then there is a lotus. Right? This is a lotus done one way. This is a lotus done another way. This is a lotus done in a different way. So this is a showing a, la uh, a stamp of a lotus. Okay. And, and then a flower is blooming. The lotus blooms slowly and slowly. And then this is a Brahmarascha, which is like this. So it's a bumblebee, which is going around um, lotus. Okay. Um, so, so you're telling, telling a story using those hand gestures. You, with the pataka, you're showing the water movement. Water is like um, with the waves up and down coming, a steel water coming, a steel water flowing. So um, just to showing different types of water movement using different hand gestures. Water is flowing from the top and meeting to the ocean. So you go from a high to low. Your body movements are ad adjusted to show the movement like flowing water, which is very high. And then you do the low pose to show that water has, has uh, um, flown from the mountain hill and now merging with the ocean. So, um, so there are so many things. This is a fish, <laughs> it's a whole language. So let me ask you, one of my observations and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the, the, the hand sometimes are very like, um, what's the word? Inflexible. Fluid. Well, you say fluid, but I'm thinking more like inflexible. Inflexible. Okay. Inflexible for In some of the okay. move, for some of the movements. And yes, there is all of this and there mm -hmm. is that and there is that. But to me, when I compare Kathak, uh, the way that the hands uh, are used, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. To mostly of what I take away, and this is just Rose October in a bubble, right? Take away with the hand movements, some of the hand movements, I should say of Bharatanatyam, mm -hmm. it seems as though there are times, there are, there met most times, and I could be wrong, most times there is that inflexibility of the hand to tell the story. Uh, but I might be off from your expression. Yeah, uh, depend on, on how inflexibility you are observing. Okay, could it be depending on the story too that the, the dancer yeah. is telling? Yeah, depend, depend on, uh, it depends on the choreography, it depends on the story and what's the, what's the whole uh, aspect of that. So it depends on that. But, okay. uh, but for me, it's a flu fluid, fluid, like uh, fluid. Uh, yeah. And there is a lot of practice happens. You have to do the whole right, um, right. Um, exercise for hands so that your muscles are in tune as your like language you're speaking. So, um, so like, yeah, so, so me, depend so on me, depend on the choreography and the topic of topic or the story. Um, yeah. Well, you know what? Confession. This is the closest I've gotten to mm. Bharatanatyam. <laughs> this is the closest, you know. And I I I wouldn't rule out taking a dance class. I mm -hmm. wouldn't. Although I know it would be challenging for me because I have such an extensive background in Kathak. You know, I, I, I can really see me struggling to hold down the fingers and, you know, get that it struggle right. is important. <laughs> that, that, in dance, that vulnerability is important. Yeah. I, I take it because of my own personal experience. Yes, I'm not going to expose myself to other dance form because I want to be a Bharatanatyam, the purest Bharatanatyam um, student and a performer. Mm -hmm. But I... I just wanted to expose myself to other other genres. Is just yeah. to just to be in that that in that moment. How your body is, so just that vulnerability is important. Yes, yes, lifelong. Uh, that's my yeah, and I'm with you there. I'm <laughs> with you there. We're partnering on this one. So we're getting, believe it or not. We are beginning to wind down. You believe yes. that? We I cannot. There's so much to talk and. <laughs> yes. I but can, let me ask you. Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. Finish your thought. You wanted no. to say. No, it's fine. I'm okay. Okay. So I, I had asked you about the, the children, how they adapted to what you were teaching them. And then the other part of the clip, the latter part of the clip was definitely community work you yeah. are actually out in in the um in 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 the community in the environment mm -hmm. and 
I know that you do a lot of that too. I'm not going to focus our last few minutes on that. But what I want us to focus on is in this reality that we're living with the coronavirus, also known as COVID-19, the coronavirus disease, also known as COVID-19, and you being a teaching artist, and you being an artist, you being a performing artist, how, how has the pandemic impacted you and your work? Yes, you saw that clip, which was a performing Garba. That's a folk style from Gujarat. Um, that's one of my dear dance style. Um, and uh, I enjoy. Which clip? Is the, that the one in the school? No, outside in the Brooklyn Bridge Park in a circle. Okay, okay. Um, second clip uh -huh. in that video. So that's a folk style. And uh, there are so many folk styles um, which I have performed here with the community. And this was like a first time Garba being performed in a Brooklyn Bridge Park, which was like amazing moment for me. Like, oh, bringing Garba in a Brooklyn Bridge Park. It was like one of the highlight of me. And um, I had selected a, a song, which is for the river and performing at the river. Um, so my work is with community. My work is engaging a hands-on activity, whether it's in a classroom and or whether I'm doing arty ceremony or whether I'm doing performances in, in a community in various locations. So now with the social distancing aspect which this virus has brought is I was like, I pause, uh, pause um, how I'm going to work now. What are my my options because without community my work is is not i cannot i cannot do my work without socializing not social distancing um and so right now i have taken this opportunity to go back within myself and find some solutions or recharge myself so that i can once we start resuming our normal, new normal, I will incorporate some plans so that once again, we are all safe back in the community, because considering social distancing, adapting those into my practices so that we all can safely continue to learn one another culture. Mm -hmm. um, and and reach our culture. Uh, there will be many, many adaptation I will have to do. I am, for especially the arti ceremony, which is, which I've been doing for since 2013 and last year, it was amazing, amazing experience with the support of the community. And I was just amazed the support I have received. And in this tough time, we, even the park is communicating with me to bring this ceremony safe, to help people heal. We are losing so many individual lives, families are grieving, and uh, we need those type of space to come and heal. And Brooklyn Bridge Park is also trying to, let's see by August what, so August 1st is confirmed for this year to perform this ceremony. I'm just putting out that date. Yeah. Uh, but uh, right now, due to this uh, COVID-19, everything is suspended. Now the plans are opening safely. So when we will come back, uh, I will keep update uh, in my website and other medias. But we have, we are in a collaboration and re-strategizing, adapting. But I'm not going to just stop doing my work and right. like, uh, but considering all the safety measures, um, we are going to be coming out in a community and make our community more powerful. 
<laughs> so right now I am reaching within myself to come up with those uh, positive energies to sustain through this tough time. Right. And resilience. Yes. Resilience earlier. Right. Captain, resilience. Right. So right now I'm in a strategy mode to add up with this COVID-19 because yes, we all want to keep ourselves safe. I am safe. I'm keeping you safe and I'm keeping my community safe. So. Thank you. Aren't we all adopting? Aren't we yeah, all adopting? So many. Even yes. like right now, I'm, I'm, uh, this is my new ornament. Usually oh. it's a different ornament. So today nice. this... <laughs> so oh, yes. that note. Go ahead. <laughs> so yes, as a, as a dancer, as a, when I was learning as a dancer, I'm going to bring back, tying back with the beginning question. I have learned so many facades of my, as a dancer, as a marketing, as a fundraising, as a performer, as, as an educator, as an advocacy, as a cultural um, exponent, um, so many facades and like writing grants and these and that. So it's like now technology, adapting technology. There you go. So it's like, oh, I need to learn this. It's so it's, it's not just one, it's you are, you are becoming a multi, multi level artist. So it's. I love it. I love it. That's a good place to end. Thank you. Thank you, Ailushi. Thank you for sitting and having this discussion with us today. For Namaste. those who joined you, for those who've joined you, joined me, joined us. Thank you very much. You, we've just heard from Ailushi Mystery. Please Google her, Ailushi Mystery. You'll find her work on the internet. And I cannot end this program today without saying thank you to Raldi Silva of RDE Pros. He is the man behind all of this virtual stuff. We thank you, Rald, for giving thank us. Thank you. Yet. Thank you very much for making this happen. Yes. And thank so, you, everybody. Thank you. And see you next week. Again, Ailushi. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you. You're welcome.